Well, three letters exchanged this week could change the course of the country's future. How very quaint. Theresa May, the EU and Nicola Sturgeon had been setting out the red lines and negotiating positions that will keep us talking for the next two years until Brexit becomes reality. I'm joined now from Kent by the former leader of the Conservative Party, Lord Howard. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, this morning. Now, you've always been a very keen. Good morning, Sophie. You've always been a very keen supporter of Brexit. Uh, this week, we've had the kind of red lines, the negotiating positions set out from both the UK and the EU, and it does feel as though the EU is perhaps standing rather firmer than some people expected, particularly, of course, on that divorce bill. Are you feeling any less optimistic now about Brexit than you were in June? Not at all. No, I'm very optimistic about the outcome. I think a good deal is in the interests of the EU and in our own interests and I'm confident that uh, good sense will prevail. I admire your optimism there. Uh, one of the perhaps more serious things uh, that's been in the news in recent weeks ha has been the future of the Union because of course we have a situation now where the Scottish nationalists want a second referendum in Scotland, the future of power sharing in Northern Ireland hangs in the balance, even Gibraltar now appears to be on the table. How worried are you about it? Um, I'm, I'm not concerned. Uh, if we take Gibraltar first, um, I think there's no question whatever that our government will stand by Gibraltar. Um, th 35 years ago this week, another woman Prime Minister sent a task force halfway across the world to defend the freedom of another small group of British people uh, against another Spanish-speaking country. And I'm absolutely certain that our current Prime Minister will show the same resolve in standing by the people of Gibraltar. At the same time, though, uh, all these questions about the future of the Union, they were hardly on the vote leave bus, were they, during the referendum campaign? Were you expecting this? Well, um, Nicola Sturgeon um, talked a very good game, um, but I, I don't think her position is quite as strong as she makes out. Um, I, I, if there is to be a second referendum, I would be amazed if uh, the Scottish people voted for independence. It's very uncertain as to whether they would be able to join the European Union. Um, their economic position has obviously weakened considerably as a result of the halving of the price of oil. And I, I'm not sure the people of Scotland want to be outside the UK and outside the EU um, in rather a lonely and precarious place. Well, if Nicola Sturgeon is uh, pl acting tough uh, after Brexit, uh, Theresa May is prepared to play pretty hardball as well, isn't she? We've seen the suggestion that security cooperation with the rest of the U EU may even be one of the negotiating chips uh, on the UK side. I mean, aren't some things more important than getting a good trade deal? Yes, and um, the security of Europe will always be a matter of great importance to us. And obviously, I'm sure we will cooperate very, very closely on security issues um, with the European Union when we leave. Um, but that cooperation will be enhanced and strengthened and reinforced if our relationship with the European Union when we leave is the deep and special relationship which the government have spoken of, rather than a relationship which is full of rancour and bitterness in, a, in an unhappy split. So that's one of the many reasons why it's in everyone's interest for us to negotiate constructively with each other in a good spirit and end up with a good deal that benefits both of us. So in that case then, was the government wrong then to bring up this spectre of stopping security cooperation? No, I think that uh, in the sense that I've just mentioned, it, it is relevant. It's relevant in the sense that we're going to be able to cooperate more wholeheartedly if we have a good relationship at the end of these negotiations um, than if it ends in, uh, in, in, in rancour and bitterness, which I hope it won't do, and I don't think it will. Let's talk for a moment about that divorce bill, because the EU has been pretty firm that that is going to be the, one of the first things uh, up for discussion before any talk of trade deals. How many billions would be acceptable, do you think? Well, I, I, I don't know the basis on which the European Union has produced uh, its figures. Indeed, it hasn't really produced any figures yet. Um, a, a House of Lords Select Committee recently reported um, that there was no real legal basis for us to pay anything. Um, but uh, as, as part of a deal, I, I, I imagine we probably would be prepared to pay something. 
And it will probably be on the basis in the negotiations that until everything is agreed, nothing is agreed. So if there is some provisional agreement on this question, it would be provisional on a good agreement being reached on everything at the end. Well, the EU has raised uh, this idea of 50 billion, pa 50 billion euros. Do you think that's anywhere in the right ballpark? I would, uh, I would be astonished if it were. And I don't think that's an official figure <clears throat> that's come out of the EU. Uh, there have been lots of leaks and rumours. Uh, I'd be amazed if it were anything like that. But if the, e if the UK does refuse to pay up, then there's a very good chance that we might not get a <coughs> trade deal at all. And that would mean tariffs, wouldn't it? That means a 10% tariff on cars, for example, 12% on clothing. I mean, that would have a huge hit, potentially, on the UK's economy. And yet, would you be saying you're prepared to walk away without a deal? Well, the, the average tariff imposed by the EU is something like 4%. And as you know, Sophie, the pound has uh, depreciated uh, by much more than 10%. So you've got to take that into account when you assess the, the consequences of tariffs. So um, I don't think that that situation would be uh, anything like a disaster for us. I think we could cope very well with that situation. But of course, it would be much, much better if we have a free trade deal, much better for the European Union as well as for us. And I'm confident that that's what will happen at the end of the two-year period. One last uh, question for you, Lord Howard. Uh, Theresa May is currently enjoying excellent approval ratings. You know how hard it can be to lead a party that's behind in the polls, facing bad headlines in the media. Do you ever feel a hint of sympathy for Jeremy Corbyn? Well, I, I, always, um, I always hesitate before intruding on, on private grief. Um, but I, I do think it's, uh, it's healthier for our parliamentary democracy if there is a reasonably strong opposition, um, not too strong if you're in government, uh, but perhaps stronger than, than it is at the moment. Lord Howard, thank you very much for your time today.